welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Well, Wendy, I'm so happy to be here with you today. I feel like there's such incredible content and conversation we can have around anxiety, around healing, around wellness, around the value of movement and exercise. And I think there's also these wonderful like tools and tips and skills um, that you've put in your new book, Good Anxiety, that are incredibly practical, valuable sort of assets you know, for our listeners to really take hold of their own lives in such an empowering way. I feel like your work is incredibly empowering. So I want to acknowledge that and welcome you to the Conversations on Healing podcast. Thank you so much, Shay. It is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to come. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Good. So, you know, I was reading your book on anxiety and I was looking at the prevalence of anxiety and I was really stunned to see that in the United States, about 28% of people or roughly 90 million um, are diagnosed with some form of an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. And that if you look beyond that at more kind of generalized anxiety, sort of non-clinical that it's about 90% of people that are experiencing anxiety on a regular basis. And I, I had to start by asking you, why do you feel that so prevalent in our culture? Yeah, that's a great place to start. And what I would say is that um, we are in um, a unique time in a bad way, unfortunately, because my simple definition of what anxiety is is that feeling of fear or worry associated with uncertain situations. We live in an uncertain time, whether it be because of the pandemic, because of political reasons, because of uh, shift, shifts in, in um, racial, uh, um, the way that we're viewing race and racial tensions. Um, and all of this is uh, neither good nor bad uh, in terms of what we're dealing with, but it does cause so much anxiety and add that on top of the competition that we already see, for example, my own students at New York University, uh, they've, uh, they and other university students already felt a a high level of anxiety. So add those, all those other levels of anxiety. Oh, I forgot to mention global warming as an uncertain um, element. So, so all of these things add up together that increase our sense of uncertainty and thereby increase our sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To your point, we are certainly living in very uncertain times. There's no doubt about that. Um, You know, one of the components of your work that I really adore is that you have such a unique spin on anxiety. I mean, first of all, the name of your recent book is called Good Anxiety. And The way that you see anxiety is that it's dynamic, that it's changeable, and also that it's a protective emotion. And so I'd I'd love to hear how you would describe anxiety as a protective emotion for our listeners. Yeah, that's a great point. So um, I say that anxiety is good because from an evolutionary standpoint, the emotion of anxiety and that underlying stress response that comes with it evolved to protect us. There's no question about that. Uh, Anxiety evolved uh, as an emotion that is actually critical for our survival. Remember, this is 2.5 million years ago when our main danger was external. We had to run away from those lions and tigers and bears. And so uh, that response that if a a twig cracked, that, oh, you get, you know, you you make quickly make that decision. Am I going to fight the bear or I'm going to run away? That was essential for our species survival. 
And that same response is in us today. And the big difference is we have the equivalent of twigs cracking 24 seven all around us on our right, on our left in front of us. And so it's, it's lost its protective element um, because the volume of our anxiety has simply turned up too high. Um, a main thesis of my book is that it still is protective. It can be a great warning signal, but step one to get back to that good, protective, valuable aspect of anxiety is to learn how to turn the volume down so that our anxiety isn't being triggered by so many different things. And so that's kind of the start, the premise of the book and why I do say, and I stand by this, that anxiety is good. Mm -hmm. And that turning the anxiety down. So I want to actually read something from um, an early section in your book. You wrote, when I started making changes to my lifestyle and began to meditate, eat healthy and exercise regularly, my brain body adjusted and adapted. The neural pathways associated with anxiety recalibrated and I felt awesome. Did my anxiety go away? No, but it showed up differently because I was responding to stress in more positive ways. Yes. And so I love that. I think that's so lovely, you know, how you describe that. And in that you describe some very important sort of tools that you were using to help kind of manage anxiety. Yes. And so I'd love for you to share with, you know, everyone who's listening, what you see as some of the key strategies for yeah. working with your anxiety in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. So my number one and number two go to in terms of, you know, what do I do right now? I just, I, I know I have a lot of anxiety. What can you do to help me? Are two that you mentioned in that quote. Uh, my number one is meditation. And, and I love to recommend breath work as, as the sub part of meditation. Why is that? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, why is that? Because we just said that anxiety evokes that stress response, that fight or flight response. Everybody's heard of that. But more people should realize that we have a part of our nervous system that counteracts that fight or flight response. It's called the rest and digest part of our nervous system. But somehow, Many fewer people have heard of it and it is designed, it's in everybody. It's not that, you know, only some people have it. We all have it and it evolved and designed and, and um, developed in parallel with that fight or flight system to bring us back down into a calm state. So it is our natural de-stressing system. And so back to what we can do, that breath work is actually activating that natural de-stressing part of our nervous system that naturally decreases our heart rate, decreases our respiration rate, and pushes blood from our muscles to our digestive and reproductive organs. And so think about this, hundreds of years ago, those monks turned to breath work as one of the most ancient forms of meditation to calm ourselves down. They didn't know about the parasympathetic nervous system. They just knew that breathing deeply could really calm us down quickly and efficiently. And so that's why I recommend breath work. And I specifically recommend a box breathing technique. I, I have no doubt that you've talked about this before in this pod podcast, which is um, inhaling for four, holding at the top for four, exhaling deeply for four counts, and holding at the bottom for four counts. So easy to do. Uh, it can quickly bring you down into a calmer state. And I like to remind people, you can do this as an anxiety invoking or provoking person is talking at you. You could you know, already start using this approach to start calming yourself down. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, my number one. My number two approach to um, either immediately or the long term, in the long term, decrease that anxiety volume in you is moving your body. Physical activity um, is one of the most powerful things that you can do to um, decrease your levels of negative affect, anxiety, stress, depression. 
And why is it doing that? Well, every single time you move your body, you are stimulating the release of a whole bunch of neurochemicals in your brain. And I'm not saying you have to go out and run, run a marathon. I'm saying, go out, take a walk outside, walk around your dining room table, or take your pet for a walk. That is releasing these neurochemicals. I like to call it a neurochemical bubble bath for your brain. And in that bubble bath is our neurotransmitters that you've heard of, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, endorphins. That is why we feel better when we move our bodies. And it has not only an immediate effect, but you do it regularly and you give your brain this wonderful bubble bath regularly. And you start to affect long-term affect levels by increasing positive affect levels at the baseline and um, decreasing negative affect levels. So those are my number one and number two. Mm. I love that. So practical, so simple and free. You can do yes. both of those with no expense whatsoever, if you would exactly. like. <laughs> exactly. It made me think, I don't know if you know Dr. Herbert Benson's work on eliciting the relaxation response, but it's mm. such beautiful work about how much conscious control we can actually have for countering that fight or flight response and actually yeah. instead intentionally in eliciting the relaxation response yeah. in our bodies. I, I think that's so important. And um, a concept that I advocate a lot is the concept is the concept of self-experimentation. You don't have to be a big scientist to explore this on your own. Self-experimentation um, is the act of trying things out, be curious about whether this activity, this show on Netflix, this uh, friend, is really relaxing and engaging for me, or maybe stress inducing. And you don't need a study to show you and to, to, to kind of notice how that happens. And a lot of uh, the content of my first book and my second book came from this um, self observation that I went on to, to, to look at the, the actual neurobiological studies of. But everybody talking about free stuff, here's another great free stuff, you know, little gift, start to notice what is affecting your mood and write that down. And that is one of the most powerful things that you can do to um, learn how to shape your own mood. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I love that. You know, that conscious awareness to our states of being that right there can elicit so much positive change because we just start to notice, oh, when I do that or when I go there, I always feel worse. Maybe I don't want to do that or maybe I don't want to go there. Exactly. <laughs> There's choice. Well, I feel like it's um, a lovely piece to add um, to our conversation today is the impetus for, you know, kind of the creation of this book, Good Anxiety, that we're talking quite a bit about today. Um, and it was two really significant losses in your life. You've dedicated the book in loving memory of both your father and your brother, um, who you lost in a very short period of time, only in three months of one another. And you share that that loss really allowed you to frame the book in a very different way because of that experience. And so I'd like for you to talk about what you learned from that grieving process that helped you to understand anxiety in a different way? Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, when these two losses happened, um, I was in the middle of, of uh, writing the book, exploring anxiety, uh, um, doing the research and, and um, uh, exploring this uncomfortable emotion. So I was, you know, knee deep in this one uncomfortable emotion that we we're all experiencing a lot, anxiety. Then um, my, my father passed away suddenly. He was in his 80s. He had dementia and he had a heart condition. So it, it was it was so sad as it always is, but not completely unexpected. But then three months later, my younger brother, who is the most, who was the most fit person that I knew for my whole life, also suddenly passed away of a heart attack. And that was just such a devastating loss. And I found myself you know, unable to work on the book on anxiety because I was dealing with, with some of the most 
difficult emotions that we go through as humans, you know, deep, deep grief. I felt in a sense that I was uh, uh, unfortunately going through this kind of masterclass of the most uncomfortable, difficult emotions that humans have. And, um, and it took a while to come out of it. And when I started to, you know, so use some of the tools that I was already talking about in anxiety, meditation, reaching out to friends and, and um, uh, uh, exercise, of course, uh, um, all of that was helping. But there was this one moment uh, as I was kind of coming out of, of that grieving process um, when I was doing a workout and the trainer, it was a video workout and the trainer on this video workout said in the context of working out and pushing yourself and pushing your, your muscles, pushing your body in new ways. She said, with great pain comes great wisdom. And I thought, oh my God, that, that is the message of this whole book. With great pain. And I was experiencing and, and coming through um, the pain of deep grief comes great wisdom. What was that wi wisdom? And I suddenly realized that wisdom was what I was noticing happening, that I had this whole new appreciation of life, um, that I was lucky, that I was lucky that I was still here, that I was lucky that all the other members of my family that are still here are still here, that there was this kind of wave of, of gratitude for all the friends that helped me get through it. And, um, uh, and, and the, I describe it in the book as um, it felt like that moment in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy went from black and white um, Kansas to the Technicolor of Oz. And it, it was, um, it was a, a realization of gratitude and joy. And it made me realize that that grief was telling me about how much I missed and I loved my father, my brother. It, it's, it, it's a hard emotion, but, but it's based, it was based in love and being able to appreciate that um, really helped me get through it. And then as I turned back to the book, it made me ask, well, if I can get this level of wisdom and understanding from this most difficult emotion that I've ever gone through, what can I learn and get out of the uncomfortable emotion of anxiety? What are there gifts there? Are there superpowers there? And what I found was there were, there were a lot of them. And with this new mindset, I went back to the anxiety book and I said, I need, I, I needed, I needed gifts. I needed superpowers. I needed all the positivity to come out of these negative emotions. And I found them and I wrote about them. Mm -hmm. And I, as I say in the book, you know, this, uh, the book would not have been the same if I hadn't gone through this experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so clear in the book how you're taking what you've learned in real life and applying it and, and really also using it to enhance your understanding of some of the science and what we do know about how the brain functions. And um, you know, there are a number of things that we have a, a pretty deep understanding of uh, in terms of the relationship between brain functioning and anxiety. And so, you really clarify in such a beautiful way, like how the brain works, but then also, you know, you weave it into your personal life experience, which I think is so lovely. And, you know, I can share my father passed away three weeks ago, very unexpectedly. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. And, you know, one of the gifts or superpowers, as you describe it, um, that already has come from that experience for me is it's really helped me to recognize the preciousness of my own life and the yeah. time, you yeah. know, that I have. And it, it almost jump started me to want to be even more conscientious and aware mm. that all of my actions and choices and values are like 100% aligned um, so that the quality of my life and the time that I do have, however long or short that is, can be well spent. And, you know, that is a huge gift of his passing for me. It's helping me to reframe my life yeah. in a way that's more on point, you know, yeah. that's more deeply connected to what feels the most 
achievable in the best possible way in, in my own lived experience. So that's beautiful. I, I feel that same way and that same growth of knowledge that you just expressed so beautifully. And, um, your, your sharing just reminded me of another, um, um, piece of information uh, that and growth that came from that, which is I always, before this happened, always had such a hard time in knowing what to say when somebody shared that there was a loss in the family. And, you know, you don't, you don't know, I, I hadn't gone through that in this way and always felt so awkward and never knew whether I was doing it right or, you know, you, you want to say exactly the right thing. And, you know, as, as I'm sure you, you've learned as you go through it, you realize that just being there and being able to say, you know, I'm, I'm just truly sorry. That's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a little thing, but it happens a lot because this is a, this is something that every single one of us will very likely go through perhaps multiple times in our life. And, you know, as you get, as you get older, maybe, maybe not when you're teenagers, but when you get older, it will happen. And this is, this is such a beautiful life lesson that, that also came. Not that I, you know, wish that this would happen to more people <laughs> so they would know that, but there are life lessons to learn. And that's just one that, that I was reminded of that, that um, it puts me at ease in, in a relatively common kind of situation that I'm in. Yeah. No, I, I so appreciate what you're sharing. And I, I resonate with that because in my own experience, probably the most valuable insight or perspective that people have offered to me is simply their authenticity. Yeah. When they were authentic and just shared, however, you know, this impacted them, however, my loss impacted them, yeah. like that was what mattered. It was just the authentic expression of it that yeah. has really resonated for me. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. So I would love to touch on the ways that people deal with difficult emotions. And mm. one of the things that I love in your book is you discuss kind of cognitive flexibility and reappraisal. Mm. And again, to me, this is the empowerment piece. This is how we can make choices. We're going to have hard things that happen in life. That's part of a human experience. But we are not simply at the mercy of that. We have choices about how we cognitively look at the things that happen to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I see in the foundation of the way you've written the book, you're using words like gifts and superpowers, you know, so how we take these difficult, challenging emotions and things and turn them into gifts and superpowers. And so I'd like I'd like for you to talk a little bit about how things like cognitive flexibility and reappraisal um, you know, our fundamental aspects of emotional regulation and can be really beneficial on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah. That is really a very powerful key. And um, I describe it as one of the gifts that does come from um, having anxiety or higher levels of anxiety, because basically that affords you lots and lots of different possibilities to practice cognitive reappraisal and to get better at it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's how learning works. So um, what is that? That is um, uh, in, in the simplest of terms, it's looking at a glass as half full instead of half empty, which you say, okay, I've always heard about that. But then you try and apply it to that person that is always just anxiety provoking in you. You think, no, that glass is always half empty. There's no way that I could, you know, I could think of this any other way. And that is where um, um, I try and come in with the book and, and, uh, and say, actually, what if that's not the case? What if you could, you know, um, see this person that for years and years that have has caused you anxiety in a particular way, whether it's a family member or a person at work or, you know, even a friend or a frenemy and just say, ah, you know, that's, that's just person X. That's how they are. They'll always be that way. 
and I'm not going to change it. I will just accept it instead of, of, of having this whole drama come up. And somebody asked me um, the other day, you know, what is the most valuable piece of advice somebody gave you to help to deal with an anxiety provoking situation? And I went back to, you know, this, this um, uh, situation of anxiety provoking person and um, uh, the, the, the vision I was given is that if you work on your self appraisal, reappraisal, that you're going to be able to look at that person and say, ah, oh, it's just them. That's fine. And somehow that was just so appealing to me. It's like, yeah, I want to be able to do that. How can I practice that? And it really is about practicing that thought for yourself. Everybody has a person like that. Um, what if, and it, it also reminds me of the beautiful practice of um, loving kindness meditation. I was taught the very first time I got to do a, a kind of a quote unquote, real loving kindness meditation. It was with the meditation expert, um, Richard Davidson and uh, Robert Thurman, the, the you know, Buddhist scholar at Columbia. They were giving a, a great presentation at NYU. And so the way it was described to me, I loved it. So they said, here's the easy version. Think about puppies and kittens and that, that love or, or babies, you know, uh, and, and think about that love that you have. Okay, that, that's your, your easy version. Next, try and bring that, that same like love and you wanna protect them, that same feeling, but just to the people that you know, the people that you know around you. That's a little bit harder, but that's, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's the next step. And then the hardest part is try and look at your worst frenemies in that same loving way. And it's the same, it's the same practice, it's the same process um, of, of um, um, seeing a new reality and uh, um, um, practicing kind of believing that. It's a, it's a practice of mindset shifting and reappraisal. And so it's, it's very, very powerful and is a powerful way to uh, decrease our stress levels uh, that, that um, are, uh, are, again, too high, uh, that, that, help, uh, that help increase this anxiety level that we're all suffering from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similarly, um, one of the practices that I've developed over time, because like you said, we all have people in our lives who will trigger anxiety or, you know, trigger a response that we'd rather not have, <laughs> yes. um, is I've learned to look at those individuals as my teachers mm. and to really embrace this idea of, oh, what, what are you offering as an opportunity for me to really receive so that I can grow and expand my capacity to love? Yeah. And, you know, in viewing it, from that perspective, I find I can slow myself down a little and, you know, not come kind of hastily from as reactive of a place, yeah. but, you know, pause a little bit and recognize that even in this too, there is value, there is a teaching, there is a beautiful lesson. If, if again, you know, the same concept, if I choose to see it and seek it as such. Yeah. And that is a conscious decision and choice. Like no one gets to do that for you. You get to do that for yourself. <laughs> exactly. I love that way of approaching it. And you remind me of one of the things that I was most surprised at as I was writing this book, which is, you know, I'm, I'm writing it. I'm trying out all the practices myself um, and realizing how anxious I actually am. <laughs> I'm an anxiety hider. Um, um, but one of the things that, that most surprised me is uh, through the course of writing this book, I found myself making friends with my own anxiety. It's like, oh, it's useful. It's not that thing that I want to kick out the door, which I've had thoughts in that direction, but it is a warning system. Okay. It's kind of like a prickly friend, not a, not a warm and cuddly friend so much, but a friend, friend, not nonetheless. And so it's that same kind of, what can I learn from 
these, these uncomfortable emotions that make us human. We're not, human is not happy all the time. Human is from happy to grief, to sadness, to anxiety, everything in the middle. And those uncomfortable emotions are there to teach us things, uh, to be our teachers, as you were saying, you know, these, these uh, uncomfortable people uh, can also become our teachers. And so um, that is kind of when I, I felt like I stepped up to a different level of my own relationship with my anxiety when I was like, okay, you're, you're there, you're there, you are my friend, lead me to understand myself better. Mm. Yeah, it's a great approach. Love that strategy. Well, I feel, Wendy, like I would be remiss if I didn't speak with you also about exercise and the brain and the relationship there between moods and emotions and everything that we go through, yeah. because you, your first book was really focused on that, you know, body of work that you pioneered as a neuroscientist and the other research in the field. So I'd love for you to talk about kind of your groundbreaking research on movement and the brain and the effects of exercise on the brain. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, I already highlighted exercise as one of uh, the best go-to kind of activities uh, if you need to decrease your anxiety levels. Um, because of that bubble bath of neurochemicals, it has an immediate effect uh, to lower anxiety levels, lower depression levels, um, lower hostility levels. But that's just the first step. Um, it, uh, there, there are more and more, in fact, even more uh, amazing um, effects of exercise on our brain. So not only can you, can you invoke it, can you use it to have an immediate effect on your mood, but again, think about what you are doing to your brain long term with that bubble bath of neurochemicals. You are making yourself you know, happier, less, less anxious uh, for the long term, and that's absolutely the case. But another key neurochemical that comes with that neurochemical bubble bath is something called a growth factor. Um, in fact, it's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. You don't have to know that name. It's a growth factor. And every time you move your body, it is uh, being released. And what does that do? Well, it's really good for one particular brain area called the hippocampus that is critical for our ability to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events. Um, this is a brain structure. It's my favorite brain structure to tell you the truth. I've studied it for many, many, many years. And um, there's uh, lots of evidence in experimental studies as well as in human studies that uh, long-term increases in exercise where you're giving your brain this regular bubble bath of now growth factors uh, can increase the size and the number of cells in your hippocampus and make your hippocampus work better. So I wanna ask all the listeners out there, how many of you want a better memory, uh, um, long-term memory part of your brain. Yes, I could already feel you. Everybody's raising their hands because I am raising my hand. That is my, as a nerdy neuroscientist, that is my number one motivation to get up every morning and do my workout every single morning, seven days a week. Um, because I want the biggest, fattest, fluffiest hippocampus that I could have. Um, also long-term, you get benefits and functional improvements in another key brain area, the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead. That helps with focus, attention, decision-making, all good things. Do I want better focus, attention, and decision-making? Yes, I do. So, so that's, that's kind of step two. You get immediate benefits. You get long-term benefits in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, as well as in long-term mood. And then the kind of cherry on top, is that with long-term regular moving your body, a long-term regular bubble bath of these neurochemicals and growth factors and, and dopamine and serotonin, what you are doing for the long-term is literally helping to protect your brain from aging and neurodegenerative disease states because the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex are two of the brain regions that are most susceptible to both aging and neurodegenerative disease states. So you're not curing those diseases. We still don't have a, um, uh, we don't have a cure for dementia or Alzheimer's disease, for example. Alzheimer's is the most common form 
of dementia. But what we are doing with regular exercise is staving off both normal aging and uh, neurodegenerative disease states because we're making our hippocampus and prefrontal cortex bigger and fatter and fluffier. And it simply takes longer for either the normal aging process or dementia and, and the, um, uh, the disease states associated with dementia to damage enough of these brain areas so that we start to have those memory uh, and focus impairments. So, you know, a win-win-win situation, I call exercise a supercharged 401k for your brain for the long term. And um, I think that it is, again, it's free as we started out with talking about. Um, it is, and, and again, you don't have to become a um, marathoner. Regular walking, regular walking has been shown to have significant protective elements, uh, protective uh, value for your brain function. So that is, that is my best pitch for why you want to think about moving your body as much as you can in the, as fun a way as you can um, today. Well, I love how passionate you are about this subject. It's so fun to hear you talking about this and, you know, it really comes across and it's so obvious how important exercise is on so many levels. We see it with the centenarians. We see that there are people who are moving every day throughout their day. And, you know, so it's a beautiful gift to be able to encourage people to move. And like you said, it, it's as simple as walking. It's not like, it's exactly what you said. It's not that you have to run a marathon or do something, you know, elaborate. Um, so I'm really glad we got to share that piece because it, you can never be reminded too much of the value exactly. of movement. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was um, a study, you conducted this pilot study that I had learned a little bit about um, during the pandemic on mindful conversations with college students. And you found that deep listening helped to decrease anxiety. And I'm so curious about that finding. Um, you know, what do you think is that relationship between listening and anxiety? Yeah, well, you know, um, first, this is a preliminary study. It hasn't been published yet, but we were so fascinated with these initial results. And it also needs to be emphasized the moment at which these, um, these experiments were done. We were in the heart of the fall and the spring semester of this first full semester where everybody went online and everybody was struggling. So, oh my, God, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to use Zoom. And uh, students went from in-person classrooms, um, actually that's not true. They had partially in-person classrooms the semester before to everything 100% Zoom. And, um, and in that, and, and there's a lot of isolation that happened at that moment for these college students. And in the heart of that isolation and uncertainty and anxiety, we gave them an opportunity to share and be listened to deeply. And we found that was a really helpful thing for them. Uh, we suspected it would be, and we found that absolutely it was. And I think that um, I, I just go back to some of the comments that we heard from our subjects. Uh, that it was, uh, our subject said, it, it was just so nice to be um, not just talked at, okay, do this assignment, please give this, you know, this big term paper in one month and this uh, huge term paper in two, two months, but to be listened to um, about a engaging topic, which happened to be, uh, you know, vacation, uh, favorite vacations. So, um, you know, we were, we were, uh, um, going for this um, uh, anxiety reducing and, and enhancing um, uh, modality of social interaction. We as humans are very social people. I knew we were in a situation of um, heightened isolation. Mm -hmm. And so in this situation, it clearly um, that, that deep listening was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder for our listeners, you know, if just knowing the possibility of this, can we listen deeply to the people in our lives who are experiencing anxiety and might that be helpful to them? You know, that yeah. obviously is a 
is a possible takeaway from this preliminary research. Yes, so. yes. We're exploring it in, in lots of different ways and trying to uh, bring it out and, and, and um, uh, uh, explore it, uh, not just in the single way that we got this first preliminary data, but um, uh, doing variations of it. So I'm excited to be able to share that a little bit later once we gather a little bit more data. Exciting. <laughs> There's always more to learn. There always, always is. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to ask you, Wendy, you know, these are conversations on healing. We love to look at health and wellness and how we heal. And, you know, what are all the things that we can do to live happier, healthier lives? And when you think of some of the milestones in your own life around your personal healing journey, what do you see as some of the milestones? Or you could define it as like, the key takeaways, however it best sits with you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there were clearly um, milestones of uh, um, milestones or big blockages <laughs> that, that when I got over them, they they became oh, this um, that was a milestone. Um, and uh, the first one was the one uh, that really my first book, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, was focused around which was um, this, this uh, kind of midlife, midlife crisis that I had um, gaining 25 pounds uh, um, as I tried uh, really, really, really hard to uh, do something that I always wanted, which was to get tenure at my university at NYU. Very difficult process, stressed myself out. I did not go about it in the, the most mindful or thoughtful way, but I mean, I was successful, um, but I ended up with 25 more pounds and, um, and, and kind of isolated myself with no strong friend, you know, uh, uh, um, social network and um, just many, many, many hours of work all alone, uh, work all alone. And so um, that's what uh, drove me. That was my wake up call to do something about that. And um, as I say in the book, I didn't, I didn't know how to make more friends, but I could go to the gym. It's like, okay, let's just go to the gym. Let's just try and get the weight issue out. And it was going to the gym, um, taking out all the carbs that I had some miraculously had appeared in my diet uh, and uh, rebalanced my diet. And oh my gosh, the, the, um, how that shifted the way I felt. It was a little bit like night and day and it didn't happen overnight, but I, I had a wake up call. I went on this river rafting trip and um, I went by myself because as I said, I had no friends and, and I didn't have a big social network, but I wanted to give myself a vacation. So that was a good, a good thing. And I went on this river rafting trip and I, I felt that I was the weakest one on the whole trip. I was in my you know, late thirties. I should not be the weakest one on this whole trip. So I came home saying, I'm never going to feel like the weakest one on the whole trip. Something has to happen. I have to get this weight off. And so that was my motivating uh, experience. And um, I started to feel better after every class. And a year and a half later, I'd lost that 25 pounds, felt great. Um, I remember the first day I went into that dance class that I went to all the time and somebody said, oh my God, I didn't even recognize you because you'd lost so much weight. And I thought, oh, thank you so much. That was such a great, you know, compliment. And, um, but it was the fact that with that weight loss and that came with lots of regular physical activity, I didn't know it at the time, but I was benefiting from a major bubble bath infusion of all those neurochemicals that I was talking about uh, that improved my, my memory, improved my focus, way improved my mood. And um, that is what inspired me to start studying the effects of exercise in my lab. I wasn't studying that before. I studied memory. So I know a lot about memory and the hippocampus, but um, uh, it was a turning point for me, kind of my physical nature, my, uh, for my mind, for my entire neuroscience research. And it started me on a journey of self-exploration using the tool of, hey, I'm a neuroscientist. I know how to study the brain. I know how to do research. Let's just try studying things that I'm really, really interested in that I think could have such amazing benefits for people. And so that started with healthy brain, happy life, the effects of exercise on the brain. And then it moved to 
anxiety and I don't know what it's going to be next, but it's going to be <laughs> exactly. something It'll in be that something same direction. Important. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see where the road takes you. Yes. Um, well, I love in your book, um, you talk about SQ, about, you know, sometimes we can get very isolated and not be socially connected. And obviously during the pandemic, it's been much easier for people to fall into that. And yet we're social beings. We need social support. We need social uh, connection. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you know about SQ and its value. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, again, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, humans are very social animals. We have large parts of our brain that have evolved to uh, process and focus on social interaction, social relationships, um, brain areas specific for faces, because recognition of human faces and the emotions that they carry are so important for our um, social quotient or our SQ. And um, I think that uh, um, you see this in the kind of evolving uh, area of um, um, social neuroscience that um, social stimuli are rewarding. Um, social interactions uh, release dopamine and uh, make us feel good. But we, all of us, well, all of us, me, I, I absolutely have had the experience where um, I may know, you know, theoretically, uh, um, academically, that social interaction is so good, but I've decided that I'm just going to isolate myself and work really hard because that is the best way uh, to to get get my goal done, and then and then it's hard to kind of get back in and 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 um, and uh, reconnect uh, with people. And I I think that actually is one of our big challenges, uh, literally right now in our society. That that all of us have been isolated because of uh, of the pandemic. And it is harder to know how to interact um, in society and to do it in, in a, a mindful and, um, uh, and, a, and a, a gracious way. And um, I think that um, activities that, that promote that, um, bo both, uh, and I'm gonna include, you know, Zoom-like activities or Zoom-based activities and face-to-face, will, I think it's really important for us as a society to think about how to bring ourselves back into a social world in a beautiful, graceful, um, easy way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, bringing people together around topics like this beautiful topic that you have um, developed this podcast on is, um, is, is a great way to start, but um, we need all those creative minds out there to start helping us think about this. This is something that I'm thinking about deeply for my NYU students and how to bring them back in um, and, and promote a positive, uh, perhaps a new kind of social interaction, one that takes into account uh, that, that there is this um, virus uh, uh, among us now, and maybe we need to think about it differently. But um, I think that's a, that's a really important uh, current topic of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this element to your work. I don't know how I see this exactly, but it's, it feels thematic to me where in your work, there's a deep level of acceptance. I, I very clearly feel that in your work on anxiety, that it's not something you push away, that your yeah. approach is very much that you receive it. Yes. And feel it. And then you have possibilities for how you can transform it and utilize the gifts contained within it. Exactly. Um, so there's something foundationally in the way that you're approaching neuroscience and kind of the applicability of it in the day to day lives of people everywhere that's very much about a receptivity and an acceptance of who we are and our strengths and vulnerabilities as people. So I really appreciate that. I want to thank you for that perspective and lens through which you're, you're doing your academic work. Thank you so much. I, I acknowledge that that is what I wanted this book to be a, an invitation, if you will, to accept your own 
anxiety. It's human. It evolved. It didn't evolve to annoy us and to be kicked out the door. It did evolve to protect us, to, uh, um, and, and to warn us. And it's in that perspective that I, I wrote the whole book. It is part of us. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, I think, I think that is, and people have said that that is, um, the unique way that I talk about it. Uh, others are like, oh, let's get rid of it. You know, <laughs> 10 ways to uh, eliminate anxiety from your life. That is absolutely not what my book is about. Um, and, and I see that, that, that could be, uh, helpful as a way to turn the volume down, but in the end, you're never going to get rid of it. It is useful. It is informative. It gives you more wisdom if you listen to it uh, about your own values. And so that's why you would never want to uh, kick it out the door and you want to accept it and make friends with it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, one of the questions that I ask all of our guests, because everyone has such a unique perspective, is how you would define or describe what healing is to you. Oh, what an interesting question. So healing to me is a very self-reflective process that allows you to learn more about yourself and to explore ways um, to evolve yourself, hopefully in the direction that you want to go. And um, I think it is, healing is part of our life's journey um, to become the person that we want to be. And I see it as, um, as, as part of everybody's life journey. So it is informative, it is, um, educational and it, um, it helps shape who we become as people. Hmm. Hmm. That's great. I love some of the ideas that you presented there. It's so great. It's so fun. I'm constantly learning from every guest, you know, not only like all of the incredible insights that you've shared and that are contained in your book. And I do highly recommend Good Anxiety. I think it's a fabulously well-written and content-rich book. So I want to say it's great. I really love it. Thank you um, so much. But also just how wonderful to, you know, hear your insights because we each have these, you know, unique human experiences that carry so much wisdom with them. And I really appreciate, you know, hearing and listening to your wisdom and what you have to offer. So thank you for that. Thanks. Well, Wendy, as we bring our conversation to a close, I just want to see if there's anything else that feels important to you to share. If there's, I just want to give you an opportunity to do that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think the last thought that I would share is that um, is a thought of my wish for all the readers of Good Anxiety. And that is, if you take the time to turn the volume down on your anxiety and turn in onto your emotions and start to think about what those uncomfortable emotions like anxiety can teach you about yourself. Um, you will start to reap the gifts or superpowers that I talk about and um, lead you to a more fulfilling, a more creative, and an overall less stressful life. And that is why I write the book, why I wrote the book. And that is what I wish for all the readers and followers of the book. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Keep up the good work. I'll be looking for your next book, whatever topic that will be on. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. To be determined. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having this conversation on Healing With Me. Thank you, Shay. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.